Let's uh, look at a, an example of computing for the buckling load of a mechanical system. So what I have drawn here is a system composed of two rigid bars, each of length L, and they're pinned together. And at the bottom, they're pinned on a pin support, so the, all the pins are frictionless. And the system is supported in the transverse direction by two linear springs with spring constant K, and then it's subjected to a vertical load P. And the trivial configuration of the system is when it's, say, straight up and down. But, and it will have that configuration for certain values of the load. But if I increase the load, at some point the system will actually tr move in the transverse direction. It will have some type of buckling configuration of the system. And so just as a, a simple sketch, I can draw what the buckle configuration may look like. So I have a rotation of the bottom link by an amount theta 1 and I have a rotation of the top link by an amount theta 2. And I, I drew both rotations in the positive sense, but uh, it's possible that, say, theta 2 would be negative, and then I'd have some type of scissor-type shape collapse of the system. But this is just one possibility. And what I'd like to do is compute at what load P does the system buckle, and also into which mode of deformation does it buckle. And the procedure is going to be relatively similar to what we had before. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the equilibrium equations for the system. So I'll start by drawing the free body diagram for both pieces, so both rigid links. So I've, I've drawn in all possible forces that are acting on, on the rigid links. And we can figure out what most of these values are just by a little bit of straight intuition. So if I look at the top piece there, first of all, the vertical force at the, at the lower pin has to be equal to P for vertical equilibrium, so some of the forces in the, uh, let's say, Y direction. Now, the, the horizontal force at the top, well, that's going to be given to me by the deflection of the top piece. So that's the spring constant multiplied by the amount of motion that I have at the top location. And the amount of motion, if I'm assuming small angles, is just going to be L theta 1 plus L theta 2. So that will give me the total motion at the top pin. So it's the sum of the, the motion of the bottom due to the bottom piece, so that's the theta 1 part, and the motion due to the top piece, so that's the theta 2. Now, for force equilibrium in the horizontal direction, the horizontal reaction at the lower pin on the top piece also has to be equal to the same value. So that tells me all the forces on the top piece. We can now move to the bottom piece and note that by Newton's second law, the vertical force at the top of the bottom piece has to also equal P. And also, the horizontal reaction uh, due to the pin at at the top location of the bottom piece is also equal to this k times l theta 1 plus l theta 2. Uh, there's also an additional force at the top pin of the bottom piece and that's going to be the, the force due to the spring which is k times its motion which is l theta 1. So that gives me that force and then the vertical force at the lowest most pin that has to equal p for vertical equilibrium and horizontal equilibrium at the bottom pin is going to be k 2 l theta 1 plus l theta 2. So that will balance the horizontal forces at the top of the bottom piece. So those that's the complete free body diagram uh, for the two rigid links in my system. And basically I've satisfied now force equilibrium in the horizontal direction and force equilibrium in the vertical direction. Uh, now this is a two-dimensional problem. Uh, I still have to enforce moment equilibrium in the system. And to do moment equilibrium for each piece, if I do the top piece, then I have this relationship here. So I've taken uh, some of the moments using clockwise uh, moments as positive in the system. And so this is some of the moments about the bottom uh, pin, if you will. And I can write moment equilibrium for the bottom piece also by summing the moments. So these are my two equilibrium equations for the system. So the force equilibrium equations are identically satisfied and then I have these two moment equilibrium equations for one for each piece of the system. So let me go ahead and rewrite my equilibrium equations. I'll factor out the thetas and so I have this matrix here times the vector theta 1 theta 2 and these are my, my equilibrium equations and what I'm looking for in terms of equilibrium is 
the situation where theta 1 and theta 2 are not necessarily equal to 0. So I'd like to see some motion theta 1, theta 2. Obviously, if I pick theta 1, theta 2 equals 0, I'll be able to satisfy these equilibrium equations identically. But what I'm interested in is the non-trivial solution. And you'll notice that what I have here are a set of homogeneous linear equations. So we have two possible solutions. The first one is theta 1 equals theta 2 equals 0. That's the trivial unbuckled case. So the system stays straight up and down. And then for a non-trivial solution, I have homogeneous linear equations. So I'm going to require that the determinant of that matrix forming my, my system of linear equations be equal to 0. So that's the condition for a non-trivial solution for when you have a set of homogeneous linear equations. So if I take the determinant, I'm going to end up with this polynomial here for p. And I can multiply it all out. And then I can use the quadratic formula. And I can solve for the values of p that will allow me to have non-trivial solutions. So I get p is equal to k over l, 3 plus or minus root 5 over 2. And so there's, there's two values here at which I have emergence of secondary solutions in my system. And it's going to be the, the smaller of these two values that will actually be the critical buckling load. So I'll, I'll go ahead and pick the minus sign here. And that gives me then the critical buckling load for my system. So p critical is k over l, 3 minus root 5 over 2. If I want to know what the shape into which the system is going to buckle, what I can do is I can plug in, in the linear equations p critical for p. And then I can solve the system of equations now for theta 1, theta 2. And that will actually give me the, the buckling shape of my system here. Now, let me point out one important feature of this problem here. It, it has This is actually what's known as an eigenvalue problem. So what I've done here is I've rewritten the equations I had on the previous page here. So I've gone ahead and taken these linear equations. And I've factored out the p terms and separated them. And I've written them in this form. And so if you look at this here, I have a matrix minus p times the identity times the vector of thetas is equal to 0. And th this is just simply the classical eigenvalue problem. So if I consider the first matrix, if I call it A, and then I have the identity, then I can write it in sort of condensed form as a theta is equal to p theta, which is just simply the standard eigenvalue problem, which we sometimes write in this other form here where I bring the p theta over and factor out the theta. So a minus p identity theta equals 0. And so we can see right away that the eigenvalues of the matrix A are actually the buckling loads of the system that we've been looking at here. So, so the p's are the eigenvalues. The corresponding thetas to each p are the eigenvectors. And they give you the mode shapes, or the, the shape into which the system is going to buckle. So the eigenvalues, again, are the buckling loads. And the eigenvectors, the corresponding eigenvectors, are the buckling modes of the system. Uh, the other thing to remember about this is it's the minimum value of the eigenvalues that's going to actually give you the, the critical value of the system. And the corresponding theta that you get is going to be the shape into which your system is going to buckle.